Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now we came to the last session of this conference, cardiology session, and I have the pleasure to introduce the chairperson of this session, Dr. Samir Madi, consultant of pediatrician in Jahra Hospital. Good afternoon, everybody. I am honored to introduce Dr. Edwin Francis, the consultant and professor of pediatrics in India. He is one of the known figures in India. He was uh, uh, one of the best cardiologists in India also, and he has more than three publications in international and national journals, and have done more than 100 invited lectures in many conferences. He was awarded best paper presentation from India in 2010, Asia specific Asia Pacific Pediatric Cardiac Society Third International Meeting at Sheba in Japan. He was awarded second best oral presentation in the International Workshop of Interventional Adult and Pediatric Congenital Cardiology in Milan. He, he was one of the key members of the pediatric cardiology team which received first British Medical Journal India 2014 Health Care Award. So, Please, Dr. Thank you for the kind words. Good afternoon, everyone. To start off, I just thank the organizers for inviting me for this wonderful meeting. I'm going, supposed to talk, speak on the murmur, <coughs> when to worry. I think it's a, probably a tough area because it's a bit subjective. Uh, <coughs> you know? It's a, a bit uh, subjective to hear what you hear. You cannot convince another guy that whether you heard it or not heard it. So <clears throat> a murmur is a subjective thing, unlike it's an objective way we can assess it. Right? So <clears throat> we'll move on to the topic. Just a few snapshots from my hometown in St. Kerala State in India. They call it a God's own country. It's a, sm a small hill station close to my hometown here. Uh, <clears throat> this was a hospital that was working, previously as a pastor of pediatric cardiology. It's again back in Cochin. So today's topic, we go by a definition, what is a functional murmur? How do you go to differentiate a pathological from a functional murmur? And when, how to counsel and how to, and when to refer? So to define, a murmur is defined as an auditory vibration resulting from a turbulent flow within the cardiovascular system. I use the word cardiovascular system instead of heart, because within the heart we call it a murmur, and outside the heart we call it a bruit. It's when the question, what is a functional murmur? Whenever it is not associated with anatomic or physiological abnormality, we call it functional. It could be known in other terms, probably like a inorganic, sorry, inorganic, normal, innocuous, benign, or probably the best term they say is innocent, because it clearly tells the information to the patient and the bystanders, probably the parents. The, usually, the murmur incidence is quite variable in different studies. Again, as I said in the introduction, it is just a subjective feeling you want to hear, so it's going to be tricky. So it varies between 5 to 80 percent in different studies, depending upon which study, where is it done, who are the examiners, who is going to do it. And then a few school-based studies have shown to be a lesser incidence of murmur because obvious reasons, because during the school health studies, they are done when the baby or the, the patient is sitting or in a standing position, unlike in a supine when in hospital-based studies. And of which only less than 1% of the murmurs is going to have a, associated with a congenital heart disease. As you all know, the incidence of congenital heart disease is around 0.8%, 1 to 2 per 1,000, of which only if many of them may not have any murmurs. Many critical heart lesions may not have men may not have any murmur. So finally, only a small percentage of your murmurs you hear in the hospital is going to have a congenital heart disease. So the real challenge is to differentiate between a pathological murmur and those a functional murmur, or those with having an underlying heart disease. So to, when you examine a murmur, you go by a systematic way and how you want to describe a murmur. As you all study in the medical school, it starts with the timing of the murmur, whether it is systolic or diastolic, whether the intensity or the grade, we'll come to that later. The location, again, it gives you clue to the diagnosis. As you all know, I'm not going to enumerate each 
examples of these diseases because as you all know, a severe aortic stenosis or moderate aortic stenosis is going to be easy to be picked up. You can, everybody can hear a good loud ejection systolic murmur in the aortic area and nobody's going to miss it. But the concern is in different scenarios, the pitch of a murmur, whether it's a low pitch or a high pitched, whether it's radiating or not, you have specific murmurs, if you have a mitral regurgitation murmur or a VSD, which all looks the same when it is in the left, heard in the left lower sternal border, but a mitral regurgitation murmur will radiate well into the apex, which can be picked up. And a response to menuas, we'll come to that in detail later. Coming to the grading of the murmur, it was first described by Dr. Levine in way back in 1950s. You have grade one, which is barely audible, probably none of us are going to hear that. They say probably the cardiologists hear it. Maybe in a quiet room, sedated patient, you may hear a good grade one murmur. A grade one doesn't mean it's, <coughs> is it, it is insignificant. It may be a quite significant murmur. Grade two is a faint, but can be easily heard. Grade three is a moderately loud murmur, but is not associated with a thrill. Grade four is associated with a thrill. And grade five and grade six, depending on the loudness, one can be heard even the step of the chest, one partly in the chest. It's not going to be any significance, though. So again, come to the question of whether it's, which is pathological, which is non-pathological. So it's quite tricky, as I said, to identify just based on murmur alone. A patient who's having a very soft murmur may have a significant LV dysfunction, and the murmur may be due to uh, mitral regurgitation. So you cannot ignore a murmur alone. You have to see the patient in total. We just can't just decide based on one finding. So what, we just go and describe what's a functional murmur. So which is, whichever is not functional is going to be pathological. Probably again, I'm used to being <coughs> learned as a functional. They say innocent is a better term. There's a mnemonic called 7S. They say it's sensitive. That is sensitive to change in position. Uh, with those having a short duration, it is a single, it is not associated with additional sounds or findings. It is limited to a small area, it's not radiating or around. It is of soft, low amplitude, it's sweet, not harsh, and it's predominantly systolic. This is a synonym in which completely com covers the majority of the functional murmurs. So what are these normal or innocent murmurs? Just describe a few of them. There are stills murmur, pulmonary flow murmur, peripheral arterial stenosis, and probably a venous sum. I'm just touching upon a few of the main ones. The stills murmur was one of the commonest one you hear. It is a vibratory quality. It is heard probably beyond infancy, most often during the, in the two to 12 years of age. It best heard at the apex and the left lower sternal border. It is better heard in supine position, and it probably originate from the echocardiogram studies, they say, from the left ventricular outflow tract. And it's better heard, most often heard in, in beyond infancy up to adulthood. Another common murmur is a pulmonary systolic ejection murmur. It arises from the RV outflow tract. It's a turbulence, as I said, across the RV outflow. It best heard at the second and third left intercostal space. It's of higher frequency. The higher frequency mean you are better hear it with the diaphragm, while the stills murmur is better heard with the bell of the oscilloscope. It's quite more prominent in supine position and in conditions where there is increased cardiac output. There is a patient present with fever, anxiety. In all these conditions, it may be more prominent based on the increased cardiac output it causes. One of the other very common innocent murmur is a pulmonary, peripheral pulmonary stenosis, physiological, especially in the newborn or in the early infancy. It almost heard in well the most common cause of murmur in the neonates or infants because of the smallish, relative smallness of the branch pulmonary arteries, because in the fetal life, there is less blood going to the lungs. So when the transition happens, the PA is a bit relatively smaller, and the angle of bifurcation is very acute. So they tend to have a turbulence at the origin of the branch pulmonary arteries, more predominantly in the left pulmonary artery, which results in this physiological innocent murmur. And one... <coughs> The innocent murmur called the venous hum is the only continuous murmur, so it can be innocent, which again is the only different one is it's more louder in the sitting position, and it's heard in the base of the heart or at the supraclavicular area. It can be actually removed, or it disappears the moment you move the head toward the other side, or you compress above the vein, or before the innominate vein joins the <coughs> subclavian to form the superior vena cava. So these are the few the prominent common innocent murmurs. Again, coming back to the question, when you need to worry, the timing of the murmur. 
any diastolic murmur, because during diastole there is less turbulence, majority of the turbulence happens during systole when there is ejection. So almost all diastolic murmurs are considered significant unless others otherwise proven. And most innocent murmurs are systolic. A grade of a murmur, when a grade three or more, obviously you need to be careful, you need to investigate further, that means you need to be worried. A few findings are a suprasternal thrill, are very characteristic biotic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis or coarctation or a PDA. Another important point is a postural variation, which is probably less at, uh, studied during the OPD or in the wards, as most innocent murmurs become less prominent in the erect position. What really happens is, is just due to increased flow, when the, any of us, one of your stands up, there's increased pooling of the blood in the veins, so there is reduced venous return to the heart which results in reduced end diastolic volume of the heart and reduced ejection, and all these innocent murmurs become less prominent. While the majority of the pathological murmurs does not change, with exceptions, a few of them become more prominent. I'll just mention the one or two of them, because these are the ones which may present with you with a very soft murmur, which may be almost like a innocent, but they have major implications if you don't pick them up. So these are the two are the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the mitral wall prolapse. As you all know, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a familial disorder in which, because it's caused by the significant hypertrophy of the left ventricle and there is reduced left ventricular volume. So when you stand up and there is reduced cardiac output or reduced end diastolic volume, the obstruction becomes more prominent and the murmur becomes more prominent. And the next is the mitral wall prolapse. Again, when there is the LV volumes comes down, there is increased prolapse of the mitral wall, most often there is a PML, the posterior mitral leaflet, or the AML, and then it results in increased uh, regurgitation and a prominent murmur. These are things you'd keep in mind while you auscultate the patient. So not stopping at murmur, there are reasons why you need to be worried when you have other clinical features, especially when there is evidence of cardiomegaly. Just don't believe on the x-ray alone because there are a lot of problems in interpreting a cardiomegaly in a pediatric x-ray. I'll come to that. While a pre hyperdermic precardium, abnormal pulsations, or features of heart failure, you have to be careful in excluding uh, significant heart disease. And other heart sounds, which again you have to be very careful, just don't focus only on the murmur. When you have a single second heart sound, it could be due to absent aortic sound when there is, or absent pulmonary sound, component of the second sound, in the transposition of great arteries, you may not hear the pulmonary sound because the iota is anterior. It could be one possibility, or it could be due to a severe pulmonary hypertension when the single S2 can result in a uh, pathological sound. Or it could be an atrial septal defect which have a very soft flow murmur across the pulmonary area, which may have a very fixed white, fixed splitting S2, which you have to pick it up to identify an atrial septal defect. Or it could be, a pre again, an ejection click in a bicuspid aortic wall, again, you may have very soft murmur. If you miss the ejection click, you miss the finding. Or loud S3 or S4 or a pericardial rub. So just to come back head on with the innocent and the pathological murmurs, innocent murmurs are majority systolic. They are ejection. They are soft or vibratory. They are grade one or two. They are normal heart sounds. They don't have an extra additional sounds. And they are loud in the supine position. And there is no evidence of heart disease other than this. While in the pathological side, you have majority of diastolic or loud or long systolic murmurs. They are harsh in character. They are grade three or more. They are abnormal splitting. And there is usually associated with additional sounds. And they are louder during the standing position. And there is evidence of other heart disease. So just a few, one or two slides on a role of ECG and X-ray. <clears throat> this was an article which came in archives of childhood, this is childhood 9, 2003, I think, 2003, I think in which they looked at whether adding an X-ray on the ECG will give you additional information before you refer them to a pediatric cardiologist. So <clears throat> they studied articles, all the midline articles between 1966 to 2000, and they found that, to our <clears throat> that ECG rarely adds to any additional value in the evaluation for sexual heart disease. Even one point, they conclude that sex X-ray examination often is misleading, they say, in the evaluation of an asymptomatic heart murmur. You have to be very careful in that, asymptomatic heart murmur. So in those cases, an X-ray and ECG usually doesn't add significantly. But having said that, probably just so an X-ray, probably was shown in my own colleague at brought to me, just want to wake you up from the sleep. What is the diagnosis? 
It is a five-month-old, a five-year-old asymptomatic child, actually referred to me as an RVH and ECG, probably it was not the, that's a different matter. Actually, here in this case, there is no, almost no abnormality in the echocardiogram. It's a schemata syndrome. You have right lung hyperplasia with the schemata. I don't have the typical schemata shadow there, but there is right lung hyperplasia. There is shifting of the, of the heart shadow to the right. So it is a typical schemata syndrome in which if you haven't seen the X-ray, you're going to miss the diagnosis. In the echocardiogram, it was almost nothing. There is no ASD. It's usually associated with ASD. But in this case, there was no ASD. But only the right upper pulmonary vein was suspected to be forming abnormally draining into the IVC, which was done a CT scan and was proven right. I'll give you another example. This is another case, actually, was not here, back home. In a seven-year-old boy referred for a soft systolic murmur. The record showed a mild turbulence in the RV outflow tract. So as I already have arrows there, it was a mediastinal mass, which was, again, a CT showed a lymphoma. So I don't want to leave a message that X-ray is insignificant, but you have to be careful and don't try to interpret too much from the X-ray. Then the question comes in, why can't we do echo in everybody? The question could be asked like, actually, it's not a viable option anyway. It's pretty expensive. Uh, it comes to around 2,000 to 3,000 US dollars. Probably it converts into something like 750 KD out here. It's unnecessary to anxiety, it causes unnecessary anxiety to the parents. If you identify a small insignificant variations, they keep on coming back. There's a patent for abnormally, what should I do? When is it going to close off? What is the size of the PFO? So you're going to create a panic in the parents and then when you do unnecessary things without real reasons, you're likely to miss things in the echocardiogram too. So just one word on the counseling of parents. <clears throat> Preferably don't scare them when you hear a doubtful murmur. Please just to advice not to scare them because most of the parents come to me saying that, oh, somebody found a thing, there's a hole in the heart. Murmurs are noises or sounds. It doesn't mean there's a hole. So parents, again, one more thing, parents should not be promised the child will outgrow the murmur. Many of the stills murmur may be heard up to the adolescence. When you become adult, probably we can't hear it properly. That's why you miss it. Just a, a recent article, which was, we discussed in our own department in Adan, I found it very interesting. It was an article on China, but the sheer numbers, 81,000 kids were examined in the school, of which a murmur was detected in 2.7 percentage, and a structural heart lesion was found in all those with murmur who underwent echocardiogram was 0.2 percentage. And a structural heart disease was found in 16 percent of the patients who had structural heart disease had only a grade two murmur, while the majority had grade three murmur. And of those who had grade two murmur and a structural heart disease, the majority had lesions with no functional significance. So they concluded that a healthy school children with murmurs less than grade two are least likely to be, have structural heart disease and you need not refer them for a pediatric cardiology evaluation. A recent study from Middle East, yet to be published, Around 50 patients referred for pediatric cardiology evaluation. A pathological murmur was a reason for referral in 250 patients, and echo was done in all of them, and only in 10 of them we found to have a structural heart problem, in which a thought to be a 90% was, who was thought to be a pathological murmur was found to be innocent. So this thing, the video is not working, and just one or two slides on when to worry when, to worry when there is no murmur. It is a cyanotic heart disease. You can see there's a large ventricular septal defect, a five-month-old. It's a pretty soft mid-diastolic rumble, which you're going to miss it, obviously, in your OPD, in a busy OPD or in your ward. There's a large VSD. So in a large VSD or a large PDA, you may not have any murmur, but you have to have other clues in the clinic examination. You're going to pick it up. Another example, here is a four-month-old child, a kid. Uh, it's a grade one to two, again, very soft murmur. You're going to miss it very likely unless you check the saturation, this is 89%, it is a total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. Again, these are things which are likely to miss. There's another case, is a transfusion of great arteries. Again, they may not have murmur. These are all major cardiac problems which present to you without any cardiac murmur. And these are other conditions. Again, there are LV dysfunction associated with myocarditis or a coarctation or a pulmonary AV fistulas or a pulmonary hypertension. Two minutes. Yes, it's going to conclude. <coughs> Just have a flow diagram. A cardiac murmur, you have options of a diastolic or a continuous murmur. You obviously go f get to refer the patient to a pediatric cardiologist. If you have a systolic murmur, you either it is mid-systolic, grade three, or holosystolic or late systolic, you refer them to a pediatric cardiologist. But if it's an early or a mid-systolic murmur, which is grade two or less, you don't have any additional findings, you refer them, you don't need any further workup.
but if symptomatic and there is additional findings, you refer them to a periodic cardiologist. To conclude, do not rely only on a murmur to prove it's guilty or is innocent. Do a thorough clinical examination before starting interpreting the murmur. Do a complete cardiac evaluation too, and if found innocent, kindly reassure the parents. And murmur, if you want to reiterate that, doesn't mean a whole. If in doubt, examine again or a later date, unless it's an emergency, because most of the time you see a patient while it's febrile, anxious, so you're likely to have prominent innocent murmurs, so you can call them back and examine them again when things are better. And many significant cardiac conditions may not have any murmur. And ECG and X-ray has only a very minimal sensitivity, and don't try to diagnose too many things from it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edwin. Now we can open the door for discussion and questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Edwin.